thank you. Um, I appreciate you guys giving me a chance to talk today. Um, so uh, a little bit about myself. I figured I'd give you guys just a tiny bit of background. Um, so uh, I'm an engineer. I started my career working in security and uh, then moved on to working uh, with an early social network called Plaxo. Um, found myself as one of the early developers building on Facebook's platform uh, when they opened up uh, their platform to third-party developers. Uh, so I, I built some uh, products that reached uh, pretty large audiences, um, including uh, causes on Facebook, um, which raised money for charities, uh, as well as the first social games, um, which, which had several million users. Um, and, and allowed me to create uh, uh, or start a career uh, in gaming. Um, so I did that for a little while. And then uh, a few years ago, I uh, returned back to the security world and uh, started building Vault 12. Um, so let's uh, get into that. So as uh, Sebastian mentioned, um, what we're building uh, is, is a system that allows you to uh, take control uh, and uh, keep your private keys private. Um, so we do that uh, through several mechanisms. Um, and I'll jump right into why that's important. So I think at this point, everybody's heard uh, some number of horror stories uh, about people that have either lost private keys or had them stolen. Um, and uh, that happens in uh, several scenarios. Uh, whether you are maintaining those private keys uh, at, a, uh, at an exchange, um, whether you're trusting them to control those and, and maintain them for you. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, quite a few problems that have happened as a result of that, uh, as well as the folks that uh, keep their private keys uh, in uh, hardware wallets um, or just as a, as a digital text file somewhere on their computer. Um, and in uh, both scenarios, we see some interesting problems, but specifically on exchanges, uh, when you leave your uh, key at an exchange, you uh, have decided to trust a third party with that information, and it introduces a, a slew of problems. Um, you know, certainly uh, there's, there's, there's hacking that uh, people read about, and I think the, uh, we, we can thank Hollywood for kind of changing the public's perception of hacking. Um, it's uh, you know, certainly not just someone uh, typing as quickly at a computer as they can in a basement. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's certainly you know, some, some level of that brute force attacking that does occur where someone is trying to break your password or, or break the encryption of a given system. Uh, but there's also a far more common and prevalent type of hacking, uh, which is social engineering. Um, and it's a particularly insidious uh, form of hacking. It's, uh, uh, you've probably read about the, uh, the SIM porting attacks on cell phones. Um, this is where an attacker decides to call AT&T uh, again and again and again in hopes that they get uh, a new person in customer service that doesn't follow the script and doesn't follow the rules and decides to actually port your phone number uh, to a phone under this hacker's control. And that allows them to then try and use uh, recovery attacks to get access to whether it be an exchange or an email and use that as a vector to get access to an exchange. Um, but all of these things uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, have created a, uh, an environment where the exchange is, is, is this central point of failure and central point of attack for these hackers. Um, and it's not just external, uh, 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 external people that are behaving in this manner. There have also been uh, uh, exchanges where you have uh, you know, willful acts of fraud and the people that are running these exchanges actually decide, hey, I'm just gonna take the money and run. Um, you know, these certainly aren't banks and they're not uh, 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 protected by FDIC insurance and that sort of thing. So exchanges are, are certainly, uh, I, I would hope, uh, scary enough that everybody avoids them for storing their private keys, but Unfortunately, the alternative uh, has been historically to simply store them on a device under your own control. This also creates uh, a central point of attack, whether it, it be theft or um, even more common, uh, loss. Um, I think we've also read stories about people that have you know, forgotten uh, uh, how to access uh, their hardware wallet or 
uh, lost access to a hard drive, um, whether through uh, you know, degradation of the actual device or throwing it out, um, all sorts of scenarios uh, that um, are essentially uh, stem from the same problem, which is that your private key is in a single place. Um, so whether it's on an exchange or on a device, having the key in a single place uh, has historically created a single point of attack and also a single point of loss. So that was the real problem we wanted to attack uh, as a company and try to figure out what's the best way that we could say, let's not keep that private key in a single place. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, we created a system that allows you to uh, take your data um, and then encrypt it and divide it up uh, amongst your group that you choose, uh, a group of devices um, that could be people or devices under your own control uh, that we call guardians. Um, and what these guardians do is they act as uh, custodians of your data for you. Um, and they don't know who uh, the other guardians are, nor they do they know what data they're controlling and, and protecting. Um, and the really nice innovation that uh, uh, came about here is that we allow you to uh, uh, reconstitute the data with a subset of those guardians. So the way we do that is using a, uh, uh, an encryption algorithm called Shamir Secret Sharing. And Shamir Secret Sharing has some really cool uh, characteristics that allow us to address both of the types of hacking I, I discussed earlier. Um, and those, uh, those, those, those attacks are, uh, if you recall, um, the brute force attacks. So Shamir Secret Sharing is uh, uh, not susceptible to brute force attacks because there is no signal uh, in, in, in any individual shard, uh, nor is there any signal in any subset of those shards that's beneath the threshold number. Um, and the threshold number uh, is a configurable number where you decide, okay, I want to have a total of, say, 10 shards, and I want three of those shards to be required in order to reconstitute that data. And that number can be two, it can be five, it can be seven. Uh, really depends uh, on, on your particular needs uh, and the way that you decide you want to access this data. Um, now, Shamir Secret Sharing is certainly not a new algorithm. It's, it's been around for over 40 years now, I think. Um, and it uh, you know, certainly is not, uh, I, I would say, new to a lot of people that know anything about cryptography. Um, so the innovation uh, that, that we brought to this, though, is the life cycle management of those shards. Um, so uh, certainly uh, the creation of those shards is a well-defined problem, but maintenance of those shards, making sure that the, the health of an ecosystem that's protecting those shards um, has been a large part of what we did. So uh, as I mentioned, the creation is a very well-defined problem and certainly uh, uh, is, uh, is, is something that's uh, I, I think, you know, we've probably, if, if you've ever been exposed to this, you've read academic papers about how uh, these shards are created. Um, and uh, the assumption, like most everything in academia, is that, you know, now that I've, I've described a solution, we're done, it's a solved problem. Um, unfortunately, uh, like many things, uh, that's just uh, the very beginning of, of what you have to do. Um, and that's uh, where, where we step in and really start to uh, add value to this ecosystem. So the distribution of these shards um, is something that we facilitate uh, through our app. And that is uh, something that uh, you're going to see as a recurring theme within uh, what we've built, which is we empower you to make these decisions as the user uh, to decide to whom should you distribute these shards, whether that be uh, you know, a group of friends that you trust, uh, family members, uh, or even devices under your own control. Um, and once that's done, uh, you, there's certainly uh, an entire like, set of, of, of maintenance operations that have to kick into place, including making sure this data is kept updated and remains within sync. Um, if you, for any reason, change uh, some of the data that you're storing with us, uh, those changes get propagated across the network that you've created. Um, 
And even more importantly, we monitor the health uh, of that uh, circle of trust that you've created. So uh, in a scenario where you have multiple people acting as guardians, uh, you could imagine that if you know, any one of those people may lose their device, uh, they, you know, whether it you know, is, is to kind of the same uh, scenario that you're susceptible to, uh, it could be you know, dropping this phone in a bathtub or, or whatever else it may be. So our system monitors the health of this and makes sure that the shards that you've distributed amongst your group of devices uh, are always safe and are always available. And if for any reason they are not, uh, we inform you so that you can then take action to decide, okay, how do I solve this problem? Because right now, Bob's phone is no longer available. I don't know if he lost it. I don't know if he decided to uh, you know, go swimming uh, with his phone or what may uh, be. But whatever the cause of that, we let you know so that you can then choose, okay, uh, how do I maintain the safety and integrity of the system that, uh, that Vault 12 is maintaining for me? Um, and then, of course, we also give you the mechanism to easily uh, access the data that you've put in this system. So uh, we give you, you know, two main mechanisms to access that data, um, the most common being unlocking it. So if for any reason you need access to these private keys, you can simply uh, you know, contact uh, some subset of your guardians, uh, whatever that threshold number is that you've established, and ask that they uh, uh, click a button which automatically sends you the data and allows you to reconstitute the keys that, that you've put in it. Um, and that's not too different from uh, the process of restoration, which is uh, something we allow you to do in the event that you lose your phone. Um, so in the event where uh, you go swimming uh, with your phone, we allow you to, uh, you know, with your new phone, uh, set up, a, set up uh, and reconnect to the guardians and the existing network that you created um, and restore access so that you can then uh, in the future continue to unlock and uh, uh, see your private keys and use them as you see fit. Um, and while none of that, I think, on its own is particularly uh, radical or outrageous, um, we chose a certain set of guiding design principles uh, that ensured this was done in a way that we didn't ask users to, uh, to trust us as a third party. Um, and instead, what we chose is to design things in a way such that the users uh, choose who they trust um, through their guardian network and no one else. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, giving users a, a decentralized uh, solution uh, would be a little bit odd if we then asked you to create a user account with us and a password and that sort of thing. So Vault 12 has no user accounts. Vault 12 has no access uh, to anyone's private keys at any time, um, nor do we have a mechanism to retrieve that. Um, and that's intentional by design because we don't want to become a a replacement for the central points of failure that we're trying to solve for. So just like exchanges are that third, uh, that third party central point of failure, uh, we did not want to then step in and subsume that role. Um, just like hardware wallets are that central point of failure, we didn't want to suddenly become that central point of failure that, that then becomes a, a target for hackers or malicious nation states uh, or any other number of, of uh, potential problems and attacks uh, uh, points uh, for malicious third party. So um, with that, um, we uh, have uh, created a, a mechanism that allows you, as, as the owner uh, of, of this phone and as the owner of your private key, to choose who you're going to trust and in what capacity. Um, we also allow the people that are acting as these guardians to choose whether or not they want to be compensated for this behavior. So there's certainly people out there that will say, okay, you know, I'm gonna do this for my mom or I'm gonna do this for my brother, I'm, I'm not gonna expect to be compensated. 
Um, but as an additional incentive, if you want, you can choose as a guardian to be compensated for the act of literally just allowing your phone to act as uh, a little bit of storage uh, for the people that you're guarding their, their data. Um, but again, this is, as, as a guiding principle, we don't dictate what that should be. Um, we allow guardians to choose. If they don't want to be compensated, they certainly don't have to be. Um, but if they're of the mindset that says, okay, well, if I'm gonna you know, be, be uh, woken up in the middle of the night so somebody can access their private keys, I, I would like to get a little bit of Ethereum, uh, we allow to do that. Um, and we also don't uh, manage that money for you. Uh, we leverage a smart contract on the Ethereum network um, so that uh, the, the money that you pay these guardians is held in escrow. Um, and as an owner of the vault, uh, you choose uh, you know, not just who those guardians are, but you also make the decision about whether or not they're doing a good job. Um, so it's not up to Vault 12 to say, hey, looks like this guardian's not doing a good job. We're not gonna pay them any Ethereum anymore. We think you should replace them. Uh, instead, what Vault 12 does is we say, hey, this person, uh, this particular device doesn't seem to be available. If you choose to replace them, you can certainly do so. And that process then replaces them in the smart contract uh, and, and will allow that the new person to be compensated and the old one no longer is. Um, and to that end, uh, we also don't dictate to you who those guardians should be. So if you choose you know, a, a group of friends that you've known since childhood, that's great. Uh, if you choose family members only, that's certainly fine. Um, or simply you know, your own devices that are under your own control. If you literally don't trust anybody else out there, that's, that's allowed as well. Um, but there are certainly guiding principles we would uh, suggest people follow, uh, including that you know, these be people you actually know. Uh, if, it's, if it's an online-only relationship, I would uh, avoid those type of people. Um, we also would recommend that you use geographically distributed people um, in the event of a natural disaster. So uh, as you can imagine, if there is, say, an earthquake, <laughs> if all of your... Uh, uh, if all of your guardians are located in the Bay Area, you may not have access to your private keys because all of those people may not have access to sell your networks at the time and that sort of thing. Um, same thing could happen for you know, areas that are susceptible to hurricanes and that sort of thing. Um, and again, in, in line with those uh, design principles, um, as Vault 12 isn't making the decision about you know, who is paid, uh, or, or you know, who uh, is not paid. Uh, we also, uh, we at least enable you and, and we give you the power to have insight into how this is happening and the frequency with which you will get paid as well as how much you've accrued uh, to date. Um, the smart contract pays out on a monthly basis, uh, but we allow every guardian to see you know, how much is coming throughout the month, how much they've earned historically. Um, and from whom they've, they've earned in the past. And that's uh, the, the, the set of mechanisms that we use, and really I think the, uh, uh, the intent behind all of this is that, again, as, as you may recall from the beginning, the central point of failure that's been created by all of these exchanges, as well as uh, hardware wallets and that sort of thing, um, We've come along and decided we want to replace that uh, rather than asking that you, that you trust a particular third party or a single device, that you create a, a circle of trust uh, that is appropriate for you um, and uh, allow you to use that to guard your private keys uh, rather than any other single point of failure. Um, now we started with private keys, uh, but certainly uh, the this, this system we designed is data agnostic. So uh, private keys are not the end all be all for uh, the vision of what we've built. Um, so we envision this being a system that you can use to protect everything from house keys, car keys, uh, wills, uh, real estate, whatever it may be. Essentially, any data that you feel uh, is uh, sensitive enough that you want it to remain private and remain under your control and not in the hands of uh, a third party that you may or may not trust. Um, so that's everything I wanted to uh, 
give you guys a little bit of time. I realize I ran a little bit uh, over what I was uh, targeting, um, but I wanted to open the floor up to questions in case anyone was curious uh, either about you know, you know, the details of what we made, how it works, um, or the why, uh, the reasoning behind uh, why we made some of the decisions that we did. Um, so yeah, if there's anything from anyone? Yes. Oh, so the question was, what does a guardian have to do for the user to access their private key? So um, at this stage, uh, what we did is we, uh, as, as the user, you are given a mechanism, uh, and we encourage people to actually speak on the phone, uh, to contact someone and say, hey, could you please unlock this for me? Um, and the reason for that is to verify that I'm actually who I'm, I'm claiming to be. Um, the Guardian, all they have to do is, is open the app and click a button that says, you know, allow them to have access. Uh, we intentionally introduce uh, a moment where we say, hey, you should really speak on the phone for security purposes to confirm that Blake's really the, 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 the uh, really does want access to this file at this moment. Uh, yes. Uh, so the question was, is there a recommend? Yeah, um, so uh, the question was, is there, two questions. First was, was there a recommended number of guardians? And the second question is, should you be paying these folks? So um, we do have a few, the, the app itself, uh, which uh, by the way is available. Uh, you can download it in the app store uh, on Google Play uh, and uh, in the next couple weeks will be uh, available in the Mac OS store as well as Windows. Um, and the, the app itself does recommend a particular number of guardians uh, based on your security needs. Um, and for most people, five guardians is uh, what we recommend simply because that number allows you to, uh, to have a good balance of security as, as well as uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, availability uh, from a backup perspective. Um, same for the threshold number. Uh, we recommend three uh, because that is a reasonable enough number that uh, uh, when you're accessing your private key, you're, you're not troubled, you're not, you're not feeling like, oh man, I've got to contact 20 people, but it also uh, creates enough of a, a buffer that protects you from uh, a social engineering attack wherein someone may you know, try to trick one or two people. Um, and, and that's one of the... Uh, really, uh, I think, appealing characteristics of Shamir's uh, secret sharing is that the uh, social engineering attacks are much more difficult uh, to execute in this scenario because you're not tricking an individual anymore. You have to trick a group of people. Um, and that group of people, you may not know who they even are, um, which certainly creates uh, uh, another barrier uh, from an attack perspective. Um, now, the second question was, uh, should you be paying uh, these people? And is, is, is that correct? Yeah, how much? Oh, how much? <laughs> um, so I, I, again, you know, we, uh, uh, we allow that to be uh, the guardian's choice. Um, and so for a given guardian, they may choose that they wanna make uh, on the order of about $10 a month or $20 a month or what, whatever it may be. And we make that flexible uh, intentionally. Um, and I think it's up to everybody to decide, is that worth it, right? Um, you know, if I was paying someone $50 a month to be one of my guardians, uh, I would expect them to get up in the middle of the night and push that button when I want access to my private key really fast. Um, and I think, you know, certainly uh, there are people out there, uh, like, I, th I think that if I tried to charge my mother uh, to act as her guardian, she would remind me of all the things she's done for me over the years. And so uh, I, I don't think that would fly. So um, the amount you should be paying uh, these people is, is really uh, contingent on the relationships you have. Um, and again, you know, we don't have any insight into that. Um, we simply are the facilitator and we allow people to make that decision for themselves. Um, did we have time for any more questions or? Okay. Um, we're at the end of the time. Uh, that being said, if you have any more questions, uh, you know, please uh, come catch me after. I'm gonna be here for a little while and I'm more than happy uh, to chat with anyone for uh, as, as long as they let me.
All right, I appreciate your time. Thank you all very much. <laughs>